Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Cheryl Cohen, founder and president of Arthritis Consumer Experts and here at the hashtag C Arthritis broadcast booth with Arthritis Broadcast Network. So we're really happy that you've tuned back in. It is really fantastic to sit here with um, an old old friend, not old, old friend and colleague, old long too. time <laughs> friend and colleague, Dr. Barry Kaler. Um, Dr. Kaler's been a practicing rheumatologist for what, about a thousand years? Just about. Just about a thousand yeah. years, uh, which time stamps both of us, yes. uh, <laughs> that I'm aware of that time stamps me as well as you. Um, but we're so thrilled to have a man not only of his um, expertise, but longevity in the community. I think um, Barry, if you'll allow me to call yeah. you Barry, uh, Barry's seen so much come in and out of your clinic uh, over a very long, long period of time. And it's that richness that I always appreciate um, when you share with me some of those things. Um, I, I just, I feel like a better kind of patient almost when I, when I walk out. Um, if we uh, subscribe to the theory that knowledge is power, then you have imparted power to a lot of patients. So thank you, thank you. for that very much. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions um, about the theme of this meeting, precision medicine, and how you view it as a clinician. Someone, what does that term mean to you as a clinician and, and to our Facebook Live and Twitter Live audiences? And also um, about checkpoint, these new buzzwords that I've heard around the hallways and seen some of the presentations about checkpoint inhibitors. What do, what do people like me, what should we know about those? Two things from your perspective, as someone who actually is in the trenches every day with us, treating us and helping us do better, get better with our diseases. Well, I think, Cheryl, one of the things, precision medicine, it's great. It, it's something we feel will focus things better, and it can, so that we can subdivide things as uh, I remember your, Murray Yearwood years ago presenting a lecture on lupus and talking about lumpers and splitters. Yeah. We're becoming splitters that we can be more precise in approaching our diagnosis. Okay. And so for things, for instance, like checkpoint inhibitors, we can look and say, well, if we turned off this, this should be helpful in controlling that disease. Right. But the operative phrase here is control. We don't yet have cures. And often as folks are listening to all of this and reading about it in Google or yeah. reading about it in the paper, they think, oh, this is amazing. You know, tomorrow I'm going to be cured of rheumatoid arthritis right. or of osteoarthritis. And we haven't reached that point yet. As good as, as no, I shouldn't say as good, as much better as we are now say compared with when I finished training in 73, uh, I mean, huge, huge steps forward in managing inflammatory arthritis. But there are still, although we can help more people, yeah. more significantly, I can tell you that there are folks that we just don't help at all with rheumatoid arthritis. Really? In terms of what people are thinking of not having any inflammation. Yeah. On the other hand, I think part of what we as rheumatologists, and we need to help folks who have the disease understand is that part of it is reducing the disease process, if you like, yeah. but part of it is understanding that it's still likely gonna be there to some degree, and part of what we do, and perhaps it, in certain parts of uh, certain types of diseases like osteoarthritis, it's learning to live more effectively with the disease. And right. that's sort of, well, you know, it, it, it sounds like. Mamby Pamby. Mamby Pamby. Yeah. But it works. Yeah. You know, I remember a lady years ago came in and she said, I've been told by a very esteemed rheumatologist that I have fibromyalgia. And she said, You know, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I understood what was going on. Uh, so she was quite prepared then to deal with that as long as she understood. Do you know that's a really interesting point that you raise because what we hear from our members across the country, and, and I hear it just in my conversations with my own friends and family, that label 
is, is, is a blessing and a curse in some ways. You've pointed out the blessing in it, that actually you can wrap your head around it, you can maybe mourn the certain part of you that that really affects, and in these diseases it's a lot of its mobility. Um, but once you get through that phase, you then can start to roll up your sleeves a bit and say, okay, what, what is it, Dr. Taylor, I can do with you then to get on the path of improved health? Um, but when we hear, you're right, when we hear as a public or as patients as public, the terms precision medicine or check, we think, oh, good, they've got the answer, give it to me. And yeah. then when we come in and you don't give it to us, we're like, well, what are they holding back, right? There's a bit of a, so it's, it's almost about aligning expectations, knowledge first, and then yeah. expectations. Exactly. And exactly. having that really good conversation. Yeah. And understanding what people are expecting. In other words, everybody expects different things. Mm. So if you come into the office for argument, say, and I say you've got X arthritis. Yeah. Your ideas and your thoughts about this may be totally different than the person that comes in next. Right. And we have to together talk about what does this mean to you? What do you think this means? So I come into your office with a, a context. I come in with social yeah. beliefs, uh, with a family you know, construct yeah. around me. What are my friends thinking about the things I've been experiencing and what, are, what, what opinions have I been hearing in my left ear while I've been hearing something yeah. else in my right ear? Exactly. I totally get that and I think a lot of our viewers understand that as well. Um, we've always used a phrase in our education programs about people with any type of disease being snowflakes. And whether you go on to become a patient or not, I think eventually all of us become a patient yeah. at one point or time in our lives. But it's, it's, really, it's really true that while the disease, you've got certain things you look for and kind of homogenize diagnosis, it's still different. The experience we bring in to your office with the disease is very different from patient to patient. Very much. Yeah. And, and where you settle with that. Yeah. You know, I tell, used to tell students we'd make them rounds of, in the good old days when you could actually get a hospital bed <laughs> and a person be there with rheumatoid disease and we'd come by with the, the group and say, well, how are you doing? And the patient said, oh, really good. But they're and in a hospital. They're bed. in a hospital. They got active arthritis. Wow. And I'd say to the students, her good day is your worst nightmare. But she's learned to deal with this and change her expectations. Yeah. Someone told me one time that one of the worst things and one of the best things for patients with um, a type of autoimmune disease, uh, in my case, rheumatoid arthritis, was a blessing and a curse again was uh, coping skills that in fact people with rheumatic diseases develop really highly tuned and powerful coping skills sometimes those coping skills can work against you in that you may not be paying close enough attention to an increase in your symptoms and that that's indicative of loss of control that what you do is you just keep coping and it's a fine balance. How do you deal? How do you deal with well, that? Well, that's why it's a team effort. Yeah. If if you come in and you say, well, "I'm really doing well," yeah. And I check your joints, and you've got ten active joints. Yeah. I'll say, Cheryl, you may may be managing well, but your arthritis stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I work well with candid, so yeah. that that works yeah. with me. Um, and, and then I guess you go about re-examining, then yeah. you open up, you kind of unpack that goal setting you took on, yeah. up, upon doing with that patient earlier when you started the therapy yeah. and go, okay, well, let's open up that box again and say, is it working? Well, clearly not yeah. if it's yeah. 10 active and swollen joints. Um, yeah, that, you know, going on the downward slope, Barry, as a patient, oftentimes people are all the way at the bottom before they realize it. Yeah. And, and it's really important for them to understand and act up here on the Be downward slope. You slide. Because it's harder to get back up the other side. Always, but you can always you can do, do it. Yeah. You can always do it. Yeah, but it, it's hard. Sometimes yeah. as a patient you oh, lose resolve, you know, and you, and you get disappointed, you get depressed. 
and then a whole other pile of circumstances um, fall on your doorstep that then you have to deal with. But there's, and then that's again that whole issue of the team. Yeah. So you, you've let things slide, your muscles have gotten weak, your, yeah. your shoulder isn't working as well. Dudley Hart, who was a rheumatologist in Britain, yeah. used to talk about bringing the patient in for a wash and a scrub. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and this is the idea. that's the time where you, you need to yeah. reconnect with the physio, reconnect with the OT, you know, reconnect with the team members. The team members. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you think about the future for patients living with all types of arthritis, but I know you particularly rheumatologists largely deal with the autoimmune types of disease. When you think about future, so personalized medicine, checkpoint inhibitors, all of that aside, what what have you seen happen to your patients? What's the future, the modern, we call them modern patients? Who are they? Why should they be modern? Well, I'm not, I think they're the same old patients. You do? Everywhere. Sure. Really? They're, 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 and so have things changed? Well, rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. big substantive change. But we still haven't cured people, right. and there are still people who have bad, unresponsive disease. Osteoarthritis, the biggest, biggest advance was Exercise. Sir, well, Sir John, Sir, Sir John Charney doing a, perfecting a total hip replacement. Right. But as, as of course, exercise as yeah. well. But it hasn't changed very much. Yeah. This is. Take another one. Gout, the commonest inflammatory arthritis in our society. Yeah. We have perfect management for it, and yet we do a lousy job of managing it. So there's a there's a management issue for a common disease. So they're, they're and so what underpins that? Is it the communication piece between doctor and yeah. patient? Is yeah, that I really so. what it boils down it, to? I think it is. Yeah. You know, I've always had this notion that if we level the field, if I don't feel like you're way up there... Well, I, I'm, I'm upset if that's... <laughs> <laughs> you are, I know. <laughs> but I just think, you know, if patients can walk in and have the kind and quality of conversation they have with their partner in life, yeah. with their friends or colleagues, whoever they trust, if we could have that type of conversation with you, we get so much further faster. Well, I think I think that's right yeah. because the reality is, is I again tell students, what, the great advantage of a team is that everybody gets a different, sees a different part of the elephant, if you like. Yeah. And so. If I go in and have rounds with the physio and the OT and the nurse, the social worker, I'll, everybody will give me a little different part of the story. Oh, nice. And, and it really changes things so much to, to hear that all. Yeah. So you're right, how we do it may differ. Is it just a one-on-one -on -one or is it a team? But I think that idea of having time to explore what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And the patient, I guess, feeling powered yeah. to, to kind of know, feel, and know that they can be themselves yeah. with you, that they need to be themselves with you, and hopefully come in with, you know, a tight list of questions mm -hmm. and really try to be, focus on being on yeah. point with you about what's bothering you at that particular time or over the recent past. Like, those are all the things we try to tell our members to get kind of get ready yeah. when they walk in to see to see their not just rheumatologist of course but their Physician. healthcare provider yeah. any anybody who's providing them with healthcare. Um, you're always so good to come and talk to us at, at this um, at the C arthritis event, and we're so thankful because you bring not only a fresh and new perspective every time you come. You bring this entire history of practicing the art of rheumatology with you, and we couldn't be more thankful. It's always fun. We always have a good always laugh. Always fun to yeah. talk to you, Cheryl. And I'm just going to look to Anita to tell, ask us, or tell us if we have any questions. In your opinion, what is the best advancement in the field of rheumatology in the past 30 years? Ooh. Probably our use, of, one, the, the development of monoclonal antibodies 
and to the... Which are biologics. Sorry. Yes. 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 Sorry. And secondly, our ability to, uh, to combine medications to get maximal effects. We, we copied the, the cancer uh, uh, physicians in learning that we could build a, a group of medications together and get a bigger response. Yeah. And those groups that you're talking about, we know a lot about them yeah. because they're the most researched, yeah. so therefore you can give a kind of a safety prediction, if you will, Yes. And, and know relatively well what the response rate will be. Yeah. And then you'll know where to build from, from there. I, I would actually, having had rheumatoid arthritis for 30 years now and also osteoarthritis, I would, I would agree with those, like as from the patient perspective and the use and knowing how to best use methotrexate, yes, I think is has yeah. revolutionized treatment. It certainly did for me. Yeah, you know, as soon as they increased my dose and I, you know, kept track of my blood tests and things and really stayed vigilant about taking it, boy, did I get better uh, faster. And probably you also, maybe you didn't, but people do. I'm feeling so well. I thought I didn't need the medication. Oh, anymore. I've done that. Oh. <laughs> She's been a sinner. I've been a sinner <laughs> myself. Other questions, Anita? Do you have any advice for patients on how we can better communicate our symptoms to healthcare providers? Hmm. Well, it's, it always depends on the healthcare provider, I have to say, but I think, I think as you really said, Gerald, think about it in advance. Think about the things that are troubling you. Ask your spouse or your significant other, what they see, because that's great sometimes. Yeah. I have a, an old friend who I, I've treated for many years, retired physician. And They're the worst. Oh, <laughs> and if her husband didn't come with her, I would, wouldn't would find out half the story. Really? And he, com he comes in with her, and, and, and so it's, it, that's okay. Bring your spouse or your friend in with you, but be prepared. Think about what you want to, and then prepare your, your physician. Say, Dr. Smith, I've got X. Uh, you know, I've got five questions I want to talk about. And I tell the medical students, you know, the reality is people aren't going to pull out this list of 50 things. Yeah. Questions. And if they did, all you have to do as a physician is say, gee, you've got a lot of issues there. Let's book another appointment to yeah. deal with the rest. Let's deal with the top three yeah, exactly. and then book appointments exactly. to deal with the rest. So that's really good practical advice. So be prepared. Make a set of key, a key question list. Yeah. Check with the people you live with yeah. to oh, see what yeah. it is they're observing. You know, what you say is absolutely spot on. I sometimes walk into my office and I'll, I'll be visibly limping and someone will say to me, wow, what's up? You're limping. I go, what? Like, I have no idea, because I'm used to coping with yeah, it. exactly. So, exactly. you know, and, that's and, the, and they notice the limp getting worse, mm -hmm. and it's only because of them pestering me. I've actually gone and tried to figure out what's wrong with my ankle, for heaven's <laughs> sakes, is because of my, my colleagues. So that's really good advice, and, and I guess follow-up uh, is important. Always, always. Yeah. I mean, you, the reality is it's a rheumatoid or any other kind of arthritis for practical purposes is there a chronic illness yeah. and it, it's not a wham bam thank you ma'am yeah. thing. You need to be followed up and you need to develop that program and it doesn't come quickly. No it doesn't and I think the last piece of advice we could give to this questioner would be I think it's really important for the physician so now I'm telling you how yeah. to do your job. Um, I what, think it's what really, else is I know. Uh, we've known each other long enough I could do that. Um, I think it's really important for healthcare providers actually to check back in with their patient at the end of the visit to say, do you have a good understanding about what you're to do? Right? Because well, a lot of people just nod and, and yeah, because they yeah. don't want to say, I don't understand. Exactly. Boy, saying you don't understand an instruction is one of the most important things patients can do. Yeah. So that you can go back and either say it in a different way or reinforce yeah. what you just said or hand them a bit of material that they can yeah. go away and digest at a later time. But I think physicians really do need to ask their patients, are we on are, side? Are we clear, are yeah. we clear yeah. with what we're going to do? Well, our, old, our old family doctor from years ago was my, always my good example. Yeah. 
because he would finish any visit. He would say, any other questions? It was nice. 99% of the time, there wasn't. But if there was, you had the opening. What the opportunity? Yeah. And you know, people, that gives them a sense that you care yeah. and that you're listening and that you want to hear from them, which I think people with um, disease arthritis, type, types of arthritis, really want to hear from, mm -hmm. from their physicians. So thanks for emulating your own uh, family doctor. Um, I think uh, we've taken up so much of your time. We're so thankful, um, Dr. Kaler, for your visit. And we hope that our viewership, um, our membership, has benefited from these this wisdoms, pearls, the cheer. Uh, he also wears a kilt from time to time. So the next time we have him on, we'll make him put his kilt on. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you at our next interview.